22. But in the book of Luke, chapter 22, we have now come to the point, uh, to the part of that day, where they need to prepare for the Passover. In Luke chapter 22, and in verse 7, we'll start reading, and we'll read down to verse 13. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he has said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Our Lord, now open our hearts. Let he the Holy Spirit teach us and bring back those things to remembrance that we studied. Lord, I pray that through these words today, those outside of Christ Jesus will understand the love that you have for them. The great love Jesus had when he carried our sins on his shoulders to the cross. I pray that today we will hear and be able to rejoice of souls being saved. And also for we that know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Let this be a day of remembrance of how much you love us. And the importance of us giving our whole self to you. And that we will be that bright and shiny light in this dark world. Please, God, help us as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The preparation for the Passover. You know, the Passover wasn't something just established that day. Actually, it is a yearly remembrance of how God intervened for the nation of Israel. Just a brief little history. If you'll join me into the book of Exodus chapter 12. Now, leave your finger there. We'll be coming back and around it and everything. But in the book of Exodus chapter 12, we see the Passover being uh, established. In chapter 12... We know, the day, we know the day in the month. The month for the Jewish calendar, the first month, is not January, but April. And so uh, we know that this is the time period for the Passover. Now, he explains in the earlier part of chapter 12 how they're supposed to prepare the meal and what they were supposed to be dressed as and, and, and all these things like this. Then they, they show us how they take the blood of the lamb slain and they would put it on the doorpost and over the mantle. And then when the death angel shall come over, when the death angel sees the blood on the post of the door and on the mantle, the, the death angel would pass over that household. But all the households that did not have that, the death angel would come in and take life. There's a song that we sing, and trust me, I'm not going to sing it. But I know you're all saying there, sing it, sing it. But no, but I won't. But uh, the song that we sing, the hymn that he will pass, he will pass over you. The blood of Jesus Christ being applied. And so if you'll notice in this chapter 12, verse 14, here's the command. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a uh, feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And so even today they celebrate the Passover. God commanded it. And uh, I think about them now preparing for this Passover. And uh, Christ is getting ready to die for us. His great love. 
I'm going to try not to tear up. But his great love is going to be manifested. And the blood that was put on the doorpost was something spectacular. But my friends, our Savior is going to die so we can have the blood applied to our life. If you please, the doorpost of our heart. And because of that love and, and that devotion to, to mankind, we are able to know for a fact that Jesus lives in our heart. And when we go through that valley of the shadow of death, or we wait for that great resurrection day when he calls us out of here, my friend, those that have the blood are going to be the ones that are ready. Those that don't have the blood applied to their life, my friends, just as Egypt was judged, so shall you be judged. You say, preacher, that's if you believe it or not. Well, let me remind you. The children of Egypt and Pharaoh didn't believe it. They didn't believe in God. Their gods were the real gods to them. But whether they believed it or not, it, it happened to them. And my friend, in all loving kindness and humbleness, I, I, I beg you, please let Jesus come into your heart today. This is the day of uh, uh, Passover preparation. The next day, Christ will be our Paschal Lamb. He will be killed and His blood applied to the mercy seat for you and I. I, uh, I think about the times that the Bible declared Jesus being the Lamb of God. If you'll join me in the book of John, chapter 1. There's this man, and this man was, man, he was a pistol. He wasn't afraid of anybody. He had the power of God in his life, and he was and is the friend of God. But John the Baptist was a, uh, a transition prophet, if you please. He was going to be the one that comes from what we would consider the Old Testament and bring in the declaration of Jesus Christ and the grace that God has for mankind. They'd been some three to four hundred years without a prophet. Malachi tried to warn him and say, hey, you know, let's get back to the Lord. Let's get back to the Lord. And, and they wouldn't heed his, his uh, uh, pleads. And, and so they went th all these. Can you imagine? I can't imagine a week without the Lord. I can't imagine a day without the Lord. Yet the children of Israel, man, I tell you what, there was no prophet. We see the religious group, how perverted and, and ungodly they had become. They were so judgmental. They, they, uh, uh, they declared what was righteousness and holiness. And, and uh, they were guilty of things that they accused other people of. But all in the name of God. But here comes John. Oh, John the Baptist, bless his heart. He had the fire of the Lord in him. And, and he had such a presence about him because uh, of, of God in him. He didn't go to the city. The city came out to him. I can imagine as he began to proclaim, they'd run back into the city. Come here, we found a prophet. A man of God, his, his words are truth. It's so exciting and people rushed to him to hear what he had to say. Well, in one of his messages in John chapter 1, we know that he's, he's been preaching the, the, the love of God and how they needed him. And verse 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. So as he's preaching, he's, he, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ coming unto him. And when he saw it, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Can you imagine this? These people are listening to his words of, uh, of, from God. And, and he sees Jesus coming down the lane, the path. And he points out. All of those people's attention that has been on him, he points it to Jesus Christ and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, 
which taketh away the sin of the world. They, were, they knew now. He declared unto him, he's the one that's going to take away the sin of the world. Oh, my. What glorious words. In verse 36 or 35. And again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking on Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. I'm telling you, the people came out to John. They loved him. They loved his words. He had their attention, not because of him, but because of the power of God and the message of God. God is the drawing agent. His words are the, are the cry to souls. It makes a lot of sense in, in John chapter 3, verse 30. His attitude, when he had all these folks looking at him, he pointed them to Jesus. And on John chapter 3, verse 30, John's humble spirit of love, he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. My friends, that what a beautiful, beautiful atmosphere that John had. He wasn't afraid to call sin, sin. My friends, I don't care what you say. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it right. When I was a young man, uh, uh, I'd go to my parents, can I do this? And they would say, no, you can't do this. It's not right. Well, oh, so-and-so's doing it. Oh, so-and-so's doing it. Their answer would come back. If everybody goes, jumps off the Broadway Tower, are you going to do it too? You say, well, no, because there's harm at the end of that. My friends, just because everyone says, well, it's not sin anymore. No, sin is still sin. Unrighteousness is still unrighteousness. Unholiness is still unholiness. I hear people say when they commit sin, they say, well, don't they know it's 2020? I don't care what day it is. It doesn't make any difference what date it is, what year it is. It doesn't make sin right. You say, well, what's sin for some is not sin for others. No, God declares sin. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 John that all unrighteousness is sin. You see, God declares what sin is. And so, so John declared unto these disciples. You say, well, okay, we have John's testimony. Oh, no, David testified of Jesus Christ being the one who was going to come and die. The prophets of old declared, declared Jesus would come. The book of Revelation tells us about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how before the foundations of the world were even created, he was a lamb slain. You see, Jesus is our lamb, our Passover lamb, if you please. As we see that they prepare for the uh, coming events of the Passover we see that he does go to this upper room. Now, back in uh, late 1979, uh, my brother and I and, and some of the folks of the church, my mom and dad, of course, uh, they're not going to send us without them going, that's for sure. We went to a place they called the upper room. And was it the upper room? I don't know. It, it could be. If you'd see the main gates of Damascus, the original main gates are probably 15 feet below ground. So was it? I don't know. But uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, similar to it. And we got to go in there and, and see what maybe the atmosphere was. And, and, and as, as we get in there, we see now that the tables have been prepared. The meals have been prepared. And uh, Jesus has his disciples there. You know, these last few hours, again, I can't stress to you the importance of Jesus with his early church. 
Again, he has that knowledge. Just in a few hours, I'm going to be taken. A few more hours, I'm going to die for the sins of mankind. So as, as the Lord, you would think that he would want to settle some things in the heart. Even though the men didn't even understand what was really happening. And it wasn't because he didn't tell them, because he did. But in this upper room, as they prepare for this supper, we see that Judas, the one who will betray Christ, is identified. You see, we've got to get this, get this thing going. And Judas, if you remember from our studies last Sunday, man, he was hotter than a wet hen. Man, I tell you what, he was upset at the Lord God just because that lady in her humbleness put the ointment on his head and on his feet in preparation for his burial. Oh, how, un, how unhappy this man was. If you'll join me now in the book of Mark, chapter 14. Mark, chapter 14. The Bible tells us this. In verse 17, I'm going to start reading, and I'll read down to verse 21 if you're with me. Mark, chapter 14, verse 17 through 21. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as he, they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. Wow! Can you imagine the atmosphere in that upper room? Jesus just out of the clear blue. Man, they're sitting there eating and, and probably fellowshipping. And all of a sudden, Jesus speaks. They all quiet down. They listen to the words of the Master. And he declares, one of you are going to betray me. I can only imagine what the disciples thought, because I know what I would think. I think, oh, Lord, you know my heart. Is it me? I don't want to betray you, God. Please, is it me? Tell me if it's me. Well, here's what happens. And they began to be sorrowful. Just as I know, just as you and I would be. They began to be sorrowful and to say unto him, One by one, is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. Oh, what a heartache. The Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Go where it for that man. If it were good were it for that man. If he had never been born. Oh, the occasion had come now. For Christ Jesus to call Judas out. Again, I can only imagine what was going through Judas's mind. Could you imagine as soon as he said that, his face turned red? Have you ever been embarrassed before? I don't care who you are. You're embarrassed. It shows on your face. If you're shocked, your countenance shows it. You, you have no time to react. Your countenance shows it. Many people show things differently. Sometimes they look down real quick. Sometimes their old lip starts to quiver through, through maybe uh, anger or, or uh, hatefulness. Some people probably have a little sheepish smile on their face. You know, they're not smiling, but they're trying to put out like, hey, I'm smiling. No, you're not. You're mad, you know. Don't you know what's going through Judas's mind? He knows my plan. He knows my plan. I'm sure he thought, how did he know? I don't know, he's God. He knows every thought before we thank him. 
He knows the number of hairs on our head. Some of us is hard. Others is not so hard at all. But no. How does he know my plan? The other's disciples understand their flesh. Oh my, they understand the weakness of their flesh. They deal with it just like you and I every day. You know, we've studied this and you know this, that all sin falls into three categories. We see it in the book of Peter, but we also saw it in the book of Genesis. We see it in the book of Matthew when the devil himself tries to tempt Christ Jesus in these three areas. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so these men that walked with Jesus, they understand their flesh. And so as they begin to think about what he said, one of you is going to betray me. The question is, Lord, is it I? In the book of John, chapter 13, the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and I know everybody said John right there. <laughs> In John chapter 13, I'd like for you to join me there. In verse 26, John chapter 13, verse 26. And we will we'll read down to verse 30. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. My friends, Jesus pointed him out. Jesus declared his unrighteousness. Jesus says, your heart is not with me. And when his heart was not with him, Satan quickly moved in. Into his heart. He said, Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Can you imagine everybody's looking at Jesus and Judas Iscariot right now? Everyone's attention is there. He gives them the bite. He's feeding him out of his own hand. He's providing for him. And soon, Judas will kiss him with a deceit. With deceit. He said, whatever you got to do, bud. Now, let's paraphrase. Bud's not in the King James Version Bible. But whatever you think you need to do, you get going. So got the devil out of there. And now it's just left his church. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, he was the treasurer, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. These old disciples, they, they looked and said, What does this mean? Well, one of them says, Well, he probably... We probably need some more things. He's the keeper of the bag. He's sending him uh, to go fetch some, some more things for the feast. And others would say, well, you know, that might be it, but I'm looking around. It looks like we have everything for the feast. Maybe the Lord wanted him to go give something to the poor because this is exactly what Judas Iscariot told the Lord. Oh, we should have, we should have uh, 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 sold that spikenard for, uh, for money so we could give it to the poor. Oh, that's what, that's what it is. Well, that's not at all what it is. It is Judas 
betraying Christ Jesus. My friends, Jesus didn't deserve this. But I know it had to be. Jesus deserves all glory and honor that his creation can give him. But Satan is in the midst. We that walk with the Lord. We that have, have God in our heart. My friends, the Lord deserves our commitment to him. You say, boy, I'm really trying. I tell you what, we decide what path we're going to take. We decide the, the purpose of our heart. We decide whether we're going to serve him or we decide whether we're going to lay there and do nothing. But our God deserves the very best out of our life. There's decisions made every day. We decide whether or not we're going to get up whether we're going to go to work, whether we're going to do the house cleaning, whether we're going to clean up the cars, whether we're going to mow the yard. We make decisions every day. But you know, one of the most important decisions not made by many is the decision to ask Jesus Christ in their heart. You see, the memorial, this Lord's Supper that he instituted is a very, very important supper. We're going to talk about this next, his supper. I'm going to have to quit right now. But tonight when we meet together, I want you to see what he now does with the church. They're there for a memorial supper of the Lord rescuing the children out of Egypt. Tonight we want to look at the memorial supper of Jesus Christ. The Lord's Supper. This supper is a memorial. And what it is a memorial of is not Jesus' death, burial, or resurrection. No. No. It is a memorial of Jesus' death. There are stipulations that come with it. It is important. And when people take of it unworthily, there's judgment for it. You see, all these things are coming to a close. And Jesus is preparing his church. Those things given to the church, my friend, is still given to the churches today. The attitudes that he, want, he wanted this church to have are the same attitudes that we ought to grab hold of and protect and be. Oh, the day of the Lord's coming. When? I don't know. But when the good master comes, we don't want to be caught sleeping. We want to be caught diligent. My friends, again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please let us talk to you. Again, I say, I trust maybe even God has put a Christian right beside you. Don't be afraid of that conversation with them. Let them tell you about a gracious God. About the one who gave the utmost gift. About the one who paid the utmost price. Because today, Jesus wants to save you. Christians, do you remember the day you got saved? Do you remember how special it was? you remember how excited you was that now you know without a shadow of a doubt that you're going to go to heaven and that Jesus walks with you every day or better than this, you walk with him every day? Have you lost that compassion and that fire and that gratefulness? We're celebrating next Sunday the resurrection of our wonderful Savior, Maybe you need to get on your knees where you're at. Get beside that old chair. Maybe get beside that old couch. Or if you're at a picnic table, get beside that old picnic table. Why don't you get down on your knees and talk with your Lord? 
Say, preacher, if I do this, I'm going to have to straighten up. There shouldn't even be a question about that. Why wouldn't we want to straighten up for the Lord? Why wouldn't we want to prepare ourselves for His coming? Why wouldn't we want to live a life that's pleasing in His eyes instead of our eyes? This whole world, it brings pleasure for about this long. And then there's the unhappiness that comes, the disappointments. You say, well, they come in Christians that are serving. Yeah, but I tell you what, we have the Lord that's pleased with us or those who do. And those trials don't seem so heavy. Those burdens don't seem so heavy. You see, our whole life is about God. It should be about God. Our nation, in our nation, our whole nation should, should all be about God. You say, where did it go wrong? The same way that it went wrong with Judas Iscariot. He closed his heart to Christ. And he opened his heart to Satan. And Satan will always be ready and willing to move in. What a blessed season. I pray that today you'll make a decision for Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we.